Hello, family and friends. Day 216 of reading and studying through the Bible in 365. My name is Kanoi. If you are new here to this Bible study, we welcome you with open arms. We are so glad that you are here. And we have been looking at 215 days of Bible study. We are more than halfway through the Bible and we do plan to read through it in its entirety by the end of this year. So it's an exciting time for all of us as we really get a deeper knowledge of the Word of God. And if you have been able to do that through this Bible study, I would love it if you could just return the favor by liking this video and also making sure you're subscribed to the channel hit that notification bell and comment below. You know, as we go along, if you have questions, if you have thoughts, we want to hear from you. We have an even tighter knit group out of this study on Facebook. So you can find that link in the description box below. We're okay, with that said, we are in the book of Nahum today. And this is only three chapters. This is the only time that we will hear about Nahum. And he is one of the minor prophets, one of two prophets who was sent to the city of Nineveh to preach against them, or at least to give a prophecy to this city. Now, Nineveh is the capital of Assyria, Assyria being Israel's greatest enemy next to Babylon. And if you remember, Jonah was actually sent to Nineveh. That's when he ran away. And that's when he got swallowed up by the fish and got spit out and was white and ended up having to go to Nineveh in the end anyway. But the good news with that is that there was the greatest revival in history. We saw 600,000 people repenting and turned toward the Lord. But now here we are 100, 150 years later, and the people are back in their ways. They are cruel once again. There is violence and bloodshed. And even though God has used Assyria as a judgment tool against Israel, we are now going to see God in his fullness of his justice, bringing his judgment upon Nineveh. So some would call this the sequel to the book of Jonah. So before we get started, as always, let us pray and prepare our hearts. Our Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for another gorgeous day. No matter where we are in the world, no matter what our weather looks like, Lord, it is still beautiful because this is the creation of your hand wherever we are. So, Lord, as we humble our hearts before you, we just ask that you will please open up our ears to be able to hear your voice, open up our eyes to be able to see new things, and open up our hearts to be able to receive your word with gladness and joy. We rejoice in who you are today, we praise you and lift you up and exalt you for being our mighty God, for being a God of justice who always does everything out of love. There is no other motive other than your love for your people, your creation. And so help us to see that today, Lord, to really have an eternal view of what you have done in the past and what you are going to do in the future as you continue to give us hope for the day that you come back, Jesus. Please forgive us, Lord, of our sins. Clear out anything that might be blocking us from being able to hear you and to have fellowship with you. If we need to stop and get it right, I pray that we will, Lord. I pray that we'll repent, turn from our ways that is hindering us from being able to walk in righteousness. Also help us, Lord, to break the bondage of bitterness and unforgiveness. I pray, God, that you will give us the ability to forgive. Give us the strength, Lord, to stand up and be the bigger person in whatever situation that we are facing. And in doing so, sometimes that means simply being quiet and taking it on the head a little bit, Lord. You know, it might ruin our pride and our ego a little, but in the end, we know it is for good. But Holy Spirit, will you speak to each and every one of us individually in our circumstances exactly what we need to do because everybody's story is different. So we thank you, Lord, for being here in our midst today, and we just pray that it will be a pleasing sacrifice to you. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And Nahum's main name actually means comfort. So some say Nahum is a Christ-like figure in the sense that he is our comforter. He brings the good news, even though this is the worst news probably Nineveh could receive. It's good news for those who are God's people or for those who Assyria was taking over and plundering. So this is an oracle, or some translations say it's a burden or a heavy message concerning Nineveh. The book of the vision of Nahum of Elkosh. Now, this is a vision, meaning there's going to be a very clear depiction of what God is speaking here. So we start off here with a reminder and an announcement of who God is and his character. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. 
Well, isn't that just the most comforting first couple of lines here? That God is jealous, He is vengeful, He is full of wrath. But we've got to remember what the word jealous means as far as being a God jealousy versus man's jealousy. Man's jealousy stirs up from a place of fear of losing something. Like I am jealous of her because I'm afraid she's going to take something from me. Whereas God is not jealous of anything. He is jealous for. He's like a protective parent who is watching their child run across the street, sees a car coming, and he is jealous for his child's safety and hurt. And therefore, he is going to do whatever it takes to be able to care for that child. Well, that's us. We are the children of God whenever we are saved. And so he is jealous for us as well. And he will make sure that we are taken care of and that anybody trying to come against us will also be taken care of in the end. So this is either going to be the best news for someone or the worst news. Well, clearly the worst news for Nineveh to hear this. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries. So don't you fight against him. Don't become his enemy. And he keeps wrath for his enemies. The Lord, though, is slow to anger. Isn't that interesting how it just kind of comes against itself, contradicts what it just said. He's slow to anger and great in power, where it really doesn't contradict because it goes right along with his jealousy for his people. He is going to be slow to anger against anybody that he loves, which is actually all people. And that means he has no temper tantrums. He doesn't just throw in the towel and, ah, you know, he doesn't get like that the way we do, the way man gets angry. He is great in his power and he is able to harness that. And the Lord will by no means clear the guilty. So once he decides that your time is up, I have been waiting long enough. I mean, in this case, he's been waiting more than a hundred years, having patience on the Assyrians and he is just. So he will bring his justice on anyone who decides not to repent and turn to him. His way is in whirlwind and storm and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up all the rivers. Bashan and Carmel wither. The bloom of Lebanon withers. The mountains quake before him and the hills melt. The earth heaves before him and the world and all who dwell in it. So he is the one and only God. Because remember, these people... They worship gods of nature. So all of these things, they think they have these multiple gods they can turn to. But he's the one and only God who controls creation. He rules over it. And so when his judgment finally does come, it will come with a fury. So who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the heat of his anger? His wrath is poured out like fire and the rocks are broken into pieces by him. So this wrath is going to be poured out on Nineveh. And thankfully for us, the wrath of God was not poured out upon us and nor will it be. It was poured out on Jesus instead. He took upon uh, that. He took that wrath upon himself so that we wouldn't have to endure it. And the Lord is good. Isn't that amazing? Right in the middle of all of this wrath and judgment, we can say the Lord is good. No matter what trials, temptations, wrath, fire, whatever is surrounding us, the Lord is always good. This is unchanging and he is good in his nature. It is eternal, an eternal state of goodness. It is an unchangeable state of goodness. And in all he does, it is always out of goodness. Now, the thing is that the enemy will always try to make you think otherwise. The enemy will try to make you think that God is not good in what he is doing. He will try to make you doubt the goodness of God. So the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. Keep an eye on that word stronghold. He is our fortress. He's our defender, our protector. He is our hiding place. He's our stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him. But, all right, so this is showing us that something's going to change here, right? With an overflowing flood or an overwhelming devastation, this is where we see the prophecy beginning, he will make a complete end of the adversaries. Now, it is known historically that the Euphrates swelled because the Euphrates went right through Nineveh, right in the middle of it. And so because the Euphrates swelled and flooded, well, the enemies were known to have entered through those flooded waterways to be able to overtake them. And we're speaking of the Babylonians and the Medes. He will make a complete end of the adversaries and will pursue his enemies into darkness. What do you plot against the Lord? He will make a complete end So no one is strong enough to fight against the Lord. So why even try? 
Trouble will not rise up a second time. And the reason why trouble will not rise up a second time is because in the first time, there will be complete destruction. For they are like entangled thorns, like drunkards as they drink. They are consumed like stubble fully dried. From who, from who you came, one who plotted evil against the Lord, a worthless counselor. So they are basically ripe for judgment. And this is the outcome. If you do try to fight against the Lord, you will become entangled in thorns. And that means that even when we sin, that is essentially our flesh fighting against God. And you do become entangled in the thorns of the enemy. You will become like a drunkard stumbling around. You will have no direction. You won't know what's going on. You'll probably be depressed and sad. You will be ripe for judgment as well if you stay in that lifestyle. Thus says the Lord. So now he's speaking to his people. Though they are at full strength and many, they will be cut down and pass away. So you don't have to worry the fact that you see a lot of them among you. Because remember, he just struck down 185,000 Assyrians by one angel's blow. Though I have afflicted you, I will afflict you no more. And now I will break his yoke from off of you and will burst your bonds apart. Now we know that by the fourth century... Assyria or Nineveh was completely destroyed and some believe that because it was so destroyed they believed it didn't even exist they were like you know I don't think Nineveh was actually a city this is probably all folktale and just to give you some context Nineveh or Assyria is in modern day northern Iraq so they were doing excavations they rediscovered the city of Nineveh when they were doing this and specifically it was the Mashki gate which meant the gate of God which is the gate that Sennacherib created at the entrance of the city of Nineveh and when it was discovered they actually set out to rebuild it so they did rebuild it in the 1970s but then isis ended up destroying it back in 2016. and so we see you know new parts of the wall and it was just an exciting time they actually found these things last year i believe so god's story never ends you know even when things are destroyed he is still there in the midst of it all and so it's kind of neat for those who were able to find it and especially for people like us who are believers and we get to see these things being unearthed literally and knowing that god is still in the midst of us same god who was back then still the same god today it's just really neat to see now the lord has given commandment about you assyria so he goes back and forth between speaking to his people and Assyria. No more shall your name be perpetuated. And this has been fulfilled. We don't know any Assyrians today. From the house of your gods, I will cut off the carved image and the metal image, and I will make your grave, for you are vile. Behold upon the mountains the feet of him who bring good news. And remember when we just read in Isaiah chapter 52 that those who declare the good news, those who partner with God to share the good news of God, have beautiful feet. Those are the ones who are actively moving with God in step with him. And today I'll you know, pose the heart check once again. What do your feet look like? Are they beautiful? Do you need a pedicure? Are you walking in step with God and what he wants you to do? Or are you walking the other direction and doing your own thing? Do you need a pedicure? And this good news, well, this is good news that will be spoken to Judah, that their greatest enemy is going to be destroyed. But ultimately, the good news is spoken through Jesus. The fact that he came, he died, he rose again, and therefore we are able to have salvation. But it also is good news of the future in the millennial kingdom when Jesus comes back to reign. He, it is he who publishes peace. So keep your feast, O Judah. Fulfill your vows, for never again shall the worthless pass through you. He is utterly cut off. So in other words, don't become careless after this victory. You need to tighten down the hatches. You need to continue with your feasts, your devotions, your prayer, going to church, fellowshipping, doing all of the things because how quickly the enemy will try to return and tear you down again. And I'm speaking about us spiritually. This is the case. We talk about it a lot. After victory, that is your most vulnerable moment for you to now prepare for the next one, to make sure things are fortified once again, to rebuild the walls, to do all the things. So now in chapter two, we move from this declaration of the judgment upon Nineveh to the description of what that judgment looks like. This is that graphic vision that comes from Nahum. The scatterer 
And some translations say the hammer. <laughs> I prefer the hammer. Like, I'll look at God as the hammer. The scatterer has come up against you. Man the ramparts. Watch the road. Now, this is spoken with a little bit of sarcasm here. It's like, protect yourself, O Nineveh, for the hammer is coming down upon you. So while they were essentially the hammer on earth, the instrument used by God to bring his judgment upon Israel, well, now he, God is like, listen, no, you weren't the hammer. I am the hammer and I'm coming down upon you. So yeah, go ahead and protect yourself. Prepare yourself. D dress for battle. Collect all of your strength. And this is specifically speaking that they need to prepare for their battle against the Medes and the Babylonians who are about to come against them. For the Lord is restoring the majesty of Jacob. And some words or translations say excellence or the beauty or the wonder of Jacob as the majesty of Israel for plunderers have plundered them and ruined their branches. And now we see this picture of the fierce and bloody battle that they will face. The shield of his mighty men is red, red because of the blood, violence and warfare. His soldiers are clothed in scarlet. The chariots come with flashing metal on the day he musters them. The cypress spears are brandished. The chariots race madly through the streets. And the chariots of this day are the, the mightiest form of weaponry. It is like our best missiles. Um, they're not gonna even prevail. They rush to and fro through the squares. They gleam like torches. They dart like lightning. He remembers his officers. They stumble as they go. So they are helpless, the leadership of these fighters. They hasten to the wall. They siege tower, or the siege tower is set up. Now what's interesting is, is that Sennacherib is actually going to go into hiding because of this battle. He's gonna to go to his personal hiding spot, which was an area that was 600 feet by 630 feet. So it was pretty, pretty big. And then he had an armory that was 18 acres where they were stocked full of weapons and wealth. But even all of that won't save him. He ends up lighting himself on fire. The river gates are opened. The palace melts away. Now the river referring to the Euphrates and the flood. And this is fulfilled because they do actually in the excavations find flood debris. Its mistress is stripped and she is carried off. So the queen of Nineveh, her name was Huzab, there's no written record of what happened to her, but we assume by this implication here that she is carried off with the rest of the people. Her slave girls lamenting, moaning like doves and beating their breasts. Nineveh is like a pool whose waters run away. Halt, halt, they cry, but none turns back. So no one is listening. You know, they are trying to stop all of the madness, but it's not gonna happen. There's nothing they can do at this point. Plunder the silver. So after the pounding from the hammer, they're not gonna see the plundering. Plunder the gold. Now, no silver or gold was found in the excavations. They found the flood debris. They actually find ash from a fire, but no silver or gold, which goes to show that they were indeed plundered. All of the silver and gold was taken away. There is no end of the treasure or of the wealth of all precious things. Desolate, desolation and ruin. Hearts melt and knees tremble. Anguish is in all loins. Now, this is hearts melting, knees trembling and anguish out of genuine fear of what is happening. I mean, if you were in the midst of all of this violence, bloodshed, warfare, we would be fearful in our flesh. But for us spiritually, our hearts melt and our knees tremble, but in a very different way. Our hearts melt for the Lord. We, they melt in such a way that we humble ourselves before him in reverence, in fear, and in awe. And our knees tremble to the point that it brings us to our knees to kneel down before the Lord in prayer and humility. So this is a kind of a picture of what our spiritual life is like when the Lord comes into our lives. All faces grow pale. Where is the lion's den? Now, they ask this question because the lion was actually the national emblem of Nineveh or of Assyria because they were like a lion who would crush its prey. And now they are being crushed by the Lion of Judah. So where is the lion's den? Where's all your lions now? The feeding place of the young lions. Where is the lion and the lioness? Where his cubs were with none to disturb. The lion tore enough for his cubs and strangled prey for his lionesses. He filled his caves with prey and his dens with torn flesh. Behold, I am against you. 
Now, this is something we never want to hear. This is not a place you ever want to be in. It is the opposite of Romans 8.31 that says, if God is for us, who can be against us? The opposite meaning, if God is against us, no one can be for us because he is all powerful in his judgment. And they think that Babylon is their greatest enemy. But right here, they will find out that that is nothing compared to God as their worst enemy at this point. Declares the Lord of hosts, I will burn your chariots and smoke and the sword shall devour your young lions and I will cut off your prey from the earth and the voice of your messengers shall no longer be heard. Now remember how they would send their messengers to try to intimidate the people. Remember the men were sitting on the walls and they were speaking in the Hebrew tongue instead of speaking Aramaic, which was the national diplomatic language. They were doing so to try to evoke fear and they would, but now your voice of your messengers will no longer be heard. It will no longer be feared. So now we see the woe to Nineveh in chapter three. Woe to the bloody city, all full of lies and plunder. No end to the prey. And again, speaking those lies, they used to try to lure people out, just like the men on the wall. They were trying to make a treaty with them and say, you know, if you guys come out, we'll be good to you. We'll give you your own cities. We'll give you your own land. You're gonna have all this good stuff. They would lure them out of their city and then they would go in and just simply destroy them and take everything from them. And this was like a false hope that they would give to people. So this will be no more. They were so cruel and there was no end to the way that they would take over people. But now it's, they're going to come to an end. The crack of the whip and rumble of the wheel, galloping horse and bounding chariot, horsemen charging, flashing sword and glittering spear, hosts of slain, heaps of corses, corpses, dead bodies without end. They stumble over their bodies. Now they were known to go into cities and plunder them, kill people, mass murder, and they would actually cut off their heads and stack them up in pyramids. And so this picture is being basically thrown back into their face. Like this is what you all are going to face. They are ripe for judgment. They are basically busy bees. Like they are busy in their own deception, their idolatry, this violence. They are also practicing, you know, paganism. They are immoral. They are even involved in witchcraft, which by the way, witchcraft has its root word in pharmakeia, which in English that's pharmacy or drugs, right? So we look at witchcraft as being associated with the abuse of drugs. And that meaning whether that is prescription drugs that are abused or recreational drugs that are abused, because this will often have a connection to the demonic. And all for the countless whorings of the prostitute, graceful and of deadly charms, who betrays nations with her whoring. So not only are they committing sin, but they are leading other nations into evil, which is even worse. And peoples with her charms. She is known as the mistress of sorceries. Behold, I am against you, declares the Lord of hosts. So this has got to be the most humbling statement being spoken, because remember, he will lift up the humble, but he will take down the proud and will lift up your skirts over your face, meaning I will publicly humiliate you, and I will make nations look at your nakedness and kingdoms at your shame. I will throw filth at you. So again, he's like throwing everything that they did back in their face and treat you with contempt. So he will make them weak and foolish and make you a spectacle. And all who look at you will shrink from you and say, wasted is Nineveh, who will grieve for her? Where shall I seek comforters for, for you? So they are all going to be glad that she is gone. There's going to be no one who will comfort Nineveh at this point. And now we take a look at their ignorance. Like they think that they are invincible. Are you better than Thebes? Now Thebes was a city that was near the Nile and it was actually a city that was destroyed by the Assyrians. So he is showing them a picture of the way they treated others. And this is going to be kind of the template by which they are destroyed themselves. And the thing is, is with Thebes, no one would have dreamed of her fall. You know, she was a powerful city. And we can kind of be like this. You know, we can think that well, we're never going to fall. No one's ever going to take us down. But we can't be prideful like that. We've always got to be humble and in prayer and praying for our nations. So are you better than Thebes? They sat by the Nile with water around her, her rampart, a sea, and water, her wall. So this means she had life, she had sustenance, she was comfortable. 
Kush, Kush was her strength. So Kush in Egypt was her ally, but in the end, not enough to save her. Egypt too, and that without limit, put, put, and the Libyans were her helpers. Yet she became an exile. She went into captivity. Her infants were dashed in pieces at the head of every street. For her honored med, lots were cast, and all her great men were bound in chains. And again, this was done by the Assyrians themselves. You also will be drunken. You will go into hiding, so you will be helpless. You will seek a refuge from the enemy. All your fortresses are like fig trees. So this word fortresses here, probably a little sarcasm, you know, because these are your fortresses are like fig trees. So they are weak with first ripe figs. If shaken, they fall into the mouth of the eater. So remember when I said, take note of that word stronghold. If we find strongholds in anything other than the Lord himself, we will be shaken. So that's why I was like, take note of that word. Where is your stronghold? What is your stronghold? Behold, your troops are women in your midst. So there are some historical records that show that there was homosexuality and in the worst form, there was masochism and sadistic practices among those in Nineveh. The gates of your land are wide open to your enemies. Fire has devoured your bars. So again, they found ash in the excavation. So this declaring the fulfillment of that prophecy. And now we see sarcastic directions once again to prepare for this battle that they are about ready to face and a battle that's going to last two years. Draw water for the siege, strengthen your forts, go into the clay, tread the mortar, take hold of the brick mold. There will the fire devour you. So it's like, go ahead and prepare, but you're still gonna be devoured. The sword will cut you off, it will devour you like the locust. And if you know anything about the locust and the way that it works, it comes in, and this is why there's such a plague with locusts, they come in by the swarms and they level the crops, literally take them down. And you can even see from aerial views how they took out sections of crops. So it will devour you like the locust, multiply yourselves like the locust, multiply like the grasshopper. You increased your merchants more than the stars of the heavens, but the locust spreads its wings and flies away. So as quickly as this locust, this destruction comes, it will disappear. Your princes are like grasshoppers, your scribes like clouds of locusts. So your leaders are going to run and they are going to go into hiding. So basically all of this leadership that they had, and they had a lot, they had a lot of offices and people at the helm. It's going to be rendered ineffective at this point. Settling on the fences in a day of cold, when the sun rises, they fly away and no one knows where they are. Your shepherds are asleep, O king of Assyria, your nobles slumber. And if you know anything about shepherds, well, if your shepherd is asleep, that flock is in complete danger of being taken out by wolves, by the enemy, even spiritually speaking. If Jesus was ever asleep, the, Satan could take us out so quickly, but he never does sleep, thank God, right? But what about us? We as shepherds to people, are we asleep? And one way to know if you are awake or asleep is church has no longer become a priority in your life. Like, yeah, maybe next weekend. Oh, I don't really want to go anymore. Ministry is something that you will only do if it is convenient for you. Prayer is no longer a priority in your life or maybe never has been. I don't know. And Bible study becomes a chore. You just don't even want to show up anymore. When you wake up in the morning, you're no longer excited about it. These are symptoms of being asleep or being sleepy. And this is our own warning saying, it's time to wake up. Your people are scattered on the mountains with none to gather them. There is no easing your hurt. Your wound is grievous. All who hear the news about you clap their hands over you. So again, no one is mourning for them. For upon whom has not come your unceasing evil. So in the end here, we see the righteous triumph and the evil fall. Now coming to the end of this reading of God's judgment, some could look at this and say, man, he is cruel. This is so cruel for the people. Even when we see warfare today and we see innocent lives falling left and right, it hurts our hearts. And a lot of people will say, how can a God of goodness and of love do something like this? 
But when you have the understanding of who God is and his nature and his character, and you understand his long suffering patience and how long he waits for people to turn to him and then they still don't. Well, the thing is, is he cannot allow sin to continue. He cannot allow it to run rampant. That's all out of his goodness and out of his love for his people. He does not want to see the sin continue and to infect others. And so in his mercy, he sees it better to simply take people out. And even today, he continues to speak through the word by saying, I am patient for now for I don't want to see anyone perish, that all should come to repentance. And so Jesus is not actually going to return until everyone has had the chance to repent, until every single person on this earth has heard the gospel. That is why there's such an urgency for us to be able to get people the good news. We need to get people to turn, to repent. We need to repent. Don't pass up when you hear your Nahum or your comforter saying, come to me, repent, get rid of the wickedness, because you wanna make sure that your calling and your election is sure, because you never know when that day of judgment is coming. Only the Father in heaven knows, even Jesus doesn't know when that day is coming, but he loves us enough to call us. So what do we do? We listen, we submit, we follow after him. We embrace the goodness of God. And this gives us that assurance as to why we don't need to worry when the wicked prosper because God says, vengeance is mine. I will deal with them. So this gives us comfort knowing that he will take care of things. So when you're looking at the news and like, Lord, what is going on here? We've got to do something about this. Well, we can trust that he will do something about it, just like he did with Nineveh. Just as he was back then, he is more than able now, but he will do it in his timing when the time is right. So we thank you, Lord, for being so good, for knowing today that everything that you do is always out of love. It is always out of love, not only for your children, but for all the people of this earth, Lord. You love each and every person and you desire for all people to come to repentance, even in their worst of the worst of wickedness, God. So I just pray, Lord, that you will help us to continue to be the mouthpiece, to continue to be the Nahams of this day, the comforters, those who bring the good news that you are a God who brings salvation to the world through Jesus. So Lord, may we share that goodness through our actions, through our words that we speak. Lord, may we allow you to be the judge and not us. Thank you so much for opening our eyes to your goodness today. And I just pray that that will continue to increase as we stay fixed in your word each and every day. We love you. We thank you for this time together. Bless your people today, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Heaven is a divine gift to us that is given by grace. We're not going to get it because we are indeed righteous. We are getting it because God loves us. But again, we will not receive that promised land. We will not receive that gift of eternal life if we don't receive Jesus. So I wanna give someone that opportunity today who is saying, I've never done that. I've never given my life to Christ. I don't know where I'm gonna go after I die, but I see now that that is real and I want to believe. So if that is you, we're gonna say a prayer I'm gonna put the words on the screen so you can say them audibly with your mouth because the Bible says that when you believe and when you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that he died and he rose again, then you will be saved. So let's pray this prayer, believe it in your heart, speak it with your mouth, and know that this is indeed the day of your salvation. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I believe that you came you died and you rose again. I thank you that all of my sins are forgiven. I confess of my sin, I turn from them, and I live my life for you. So I receive you now as Lord and Savior of my life. I belong to you, Jesus. I pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.